seeming powerful. Honestly, I myself prefer if they're just almost getting you. Like, think of the Terminator in the original movie. He is a fraction of a second from shooting Sarah at the club Tech Noir, and it's because someone else helps that she survives. You know, he doesn't start shooting and not hit her and then she takes cover or something. I like how the prince putting on the Sandwraith mask is like Jim Carrey's first transformation in the movie The Mask, only on LSD. And finding that he's been completely physically transformed, the prince slash Sandwraith lets out a horrifying scream! Or at least I think it's a scream, but I have no intimate understanding of the vocal cords of the Sandwraith, and it frankly sounds so strange that I wouldn't rule out the possibility that it could just be a very loaded burp. It is pretty fitting with his personality and attitude in this that he really doesn't think things through about the whole mask. He doesn't think, could I maybe have done this before? He doesn't wonder if there are any ill effects. Oh, and the prince's darker half owns the Sandwraith prince. Way cooler. Even though the darker half prince, I think, actually loses health faster than the Sandwraith prince. And finally, the two thrones. I kind of like the cynicism of the darker half. I especially love the line, Oh, great, now she's going to kill us. That really made me laugh. I like how the prince matures over these three games. You know, in the first one, he's like a child. You know, he unleashes the sands without thinking about the consequences. You know, he's just curious and immature. And then in Warrior Within, he's like an angry, rebellious teenager. He doesn't want to face reality. He still can't take the consequences of his actions. He keeps trying to fix things. And then in this one, he grows up, he matures, he becomes an adult. He accepts responsibility. Yes, Babylon was hit, and it was hit hard. His father died. But the vizier Servan is now gone, and the sands of time are just removed, you know. There's no more chance of unleashing them. And I like that early moment where he saves some people, but then he starts to turn and he runs away because he doesn't want to be seen like that. You know, he still has some of that darkness within him. He can't quite face people yet, and he hasn't dealt with the pain and the anger of all those years of being chased by the Dahaka. And then later in the game, he actually wills the darker half away. You know, there's no water, but he takes over control because he's accepted his responsibility, you know, upon finding his father. I kind of like that puzzle where you have to move the statue of the father to break open the burning building. This building is beautiful. They used to all be like this. My father built these gardens as a symbol of the love he has for his people. Oh look, that lever will probably take us further. Okay, I guess the moment's over. He's turned into something hideous. No, he's turned into something beautiful. No, he just looks goofy. He looks like a cross between a giant bug and, you know, that unit in StarCraft on Protoss' side, the Archon or whatever it's called. You know, the big blue ball of energy with a sort of humanoid figure in the middle. It's so good to see my people safe. Look, a monster! I will pursue him in this conveniently placed chariot! I hate pomegranates. They're impossible to eat with dignity. So much trouble for so few seeds, and sand gets in everywhere. Wait, that's not the line. Seriously, at times, the way the prince is talking to Farah is kind of Anakin on Padme. Trust me, that's not something any of us want to be reminded of. Anyway, those were my thoughts on the first six Prince of Persia games. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you next time.